one of the first European visitors to Ethiopia at the Middle Ages, a Portuguese friar, he wrote back that he was ashamed about what he was about to uh, report because it was so incredible that people wouldn't believe him. And even what he had already written, people wouldn't believe him. But he, and he said, I assure you this is true. And he was referring to churches in Ethiopia being cut entirely by rock, carved out of one huge rock. There is a lot of ignorance regarding Africa, and people seem to be able to get away with saying nonsense, and people believe this or believe that, well, whether it's ex uh, saying things they did that they never, never did, or exaggerated accounts of savagery, or <clears throat> denying their accomplishments. Someone recently referred me to the fractals. People have been finding that they computer-generated graphics go along with the, the arrangements of African architecture. And this complicated mathematics that is indigenous to Africa, their, their architecture, and even somehow their culture. And instead of me explaining this, you can watch it. For a while now, I have been having the feeling that there is something important in African culture, their educational system. I mean, the, the things that they've been able to achieve, they, they, they've been highly regarded for mathematics, even as slaves and the descendants of slaves, they've accomplished many things, and I attribute this to educational system. And while I was looking for things on there, you know, criticisms on the, his theories about the fractals, I wasn't able to find anybody saying how this is wrong or how this is nonsense as suicide. So I didn't find anything about that. I did find, happen to find an article, kind of related, critical indigenous African education and knowledge, and the, uh, the author of this article talks about uh, the misconceptions about Africa and the misconceptions about how all education, all development in Africa stems from Europeans and Islam. Even Islamic communities are still African, they're African Muslims. So I, I won't go much farther now, I'll just say a few things about this article. You might disagree with some things he says, but it's generally true if you look through things and he talks about, you know, Africans have to have to build on, you know, what they have indigenously, you know, build on the African government and African models of government and modernize that way. So I, I would say Western, uh, modernized, not Westernized. And uh, he talks about ancient Egypt, and one criticism I have would be the Sudan had civilizations that were contemporary to Egypt, or even predate Egypt. And he mentions the Asongo bone that goes back to over 20,000 BC. Uh, recent study, more recent updated studies of stone, not the date that he gave. He's, he gave a, an outdate date. I have this as a response to African art legacy and it goes with that because they also talk about these uh, sculptures, they're like computer design hundreds of years ago and that goes along with this mathematics. I want to start my story in Germany in 1877 the mathematician named George Cantor. And Cantor decided he was going to take a line and erase the middle third of the line and then take those two resulting lines and bring them back into the same process, a recursive process. So he starts out with one line and then two and then four and then 16 and so on. And if he does this an infinite number of times, which you can do in mathematics, he ends up with an infinite number of lines, each of which has an infinite number of points in it. 
So he realized he had a set whose number of elements was larger than infinity. And this blew his mind, literally. He checked in the sanitarium. And when he came out of the sanitarium, he, he was convinced that he had been put on Earth to found transfinite set theory because the largest set of infinity would be God himself. He was a very religious man. He's a mathematician on a mission. And other mathematicians did the same sort of thing. Uh, Swedish mathematician von Koch decided that instead of subtracting lines, he would add them. And so he came up with this beautiful curve. And there's no particular reason why we have to start with this seed shape. We can use any, uh, any seed shape we like. And uh, I'll rearrange this and I'll stick this somewhere down there. Okay. And uh, now upon iteration, that seed shape sort of unfolds into a very different looking structure. So these all have the property of self-similarity. The part looks like the whole. It's the same pattern at many different scales. Now, mathematicians thought this was very strange because as you shrink a ruler down, you measure a longer and longer length. And since they went through the iterations an infinite number of times, as the ruler shrinks down to infinity, the length goes okay. to infinity. This made no sense at all. So they consigned these curves to the back of the math books. They said, these are pathological curves and we don't have to discuss them. <laughs> and that worked for 100 years. And then in 1977, Benoit Mandelbrot, a French mathematician, realized that if you do computer graphics and use the, these shapes he called fractals, you get the shapes of nature. You get uh, the human lungs, you get acacia trees, you get ferns, you get these beautiful natural forms. If you um, take your, your, your thumb and your index finger and look right where they meet, go ahead and do that now, and, and relax your, your, your hand, you'll see a crinkle and then a wrinkle within the crinkle, and a crinkle within the wrinkle within, right? Your body is covered with fractals. The mathematicians who were saying these are pathological, useless shapes, they were breathing those words with fractal lungs. It's very ironic. <laughs> and I'll show you a little natural recursion here. We, we, again, we just take these lines and recursively replace them with the whole shape. So, so here's the second iteration, third, fourth, and, uh, and so on. So nature has this self-similar structure. Nature uses self-organizing systems. Now, in the 1980s, I happened to notice that uh, if you look at an aerial photograph of an African village, you see fractals. And I thought, this is fabulous. I wonder why. And of course, I had to go to Africa and, and ask folks why. Um, so I got a Fulbright uh, scholarship to, to, to uh, just travel around Africa for a year asking people why they were building fractals, uh, which is a great job if you can get it. <laughs> and so I, I, I finally got to this city, um, and I'd done a, a, a little fractal model for the, the city, just to see how, how it would sort of unfold. But when I got there, um, I got to the, 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 this palace of the chief, uh, and my French is not very good. I said something like, I'm a mathematician and I would like to stand on your roof. Um, but he was really cool about it. He took me up there and we talked about fractals. And, and he said, oh yeah, 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 we, we knew a rectangle within a rectangle within a rectangle. We know all about that. And it turns out the royal insignia has a rectangle within a rectangle within a rectangle. And the path through that palace is actually this, this spiral here. And as you go through the, the path, you have to get more and more polite. So they're mapping the social scaling onto the geometric scale. It's a conscious uh, pattern. It is, it is not unconscious like a, a termite mound fractal. Uh, this is a, a village in southern Zambia, the ba Baila uh, built this village, about 400 meters in diameter. Um, you have a huge ring. The rings that uh, represent the family enclosures get larger and larger as you go towards the back. And then you have the chief's ring here in, 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 uh, towards the back, and then the chief's uh, immediate family uh, in that ring. So here's a little fractal model for it. Here's one house with the sacred altar. Uh, here's the house of houses, the family enclosure, uh, with the, the humans here where the sacred altar would be. And then here's the village as a whole, a ring of ring of rings uh, with the chief's extended family here, the chief's immediate family here. And then here, there's a tiny village only this big. Now you might wonder, how can people fit in a tiny village only this big? That's because they're spirit people. It's the ancestors. And of course, the spirit people have a little miniature village in their village, right? So it's just like George Cantor said, the, the, the recursion continues forever. This is in the Mandara Mountains near the Nigerian border in, in Cameroon, Mukulek. I, I saw this diagram drawn by a French um, architect and I thought, wow, what a beautiful fractal. So I tried to uh, come up with a seed shape which upon iteration would unfold into this thing. I came up with this uh, structure here. Let's see, first iteration, second, third, fourth. Now, after I did the simulation, I realized the whole village kind of spirals around just like this, and here's that repli replicating line, self-replicating line that, that unfolds into the fractal. 
Well, I noticed that line is about where the only square building in the village is at. So when I got to the village, I said, can you take me to the square building? I think, you know, something's going on there. And they said, well, we can take you there, but you can't go inside because that's the sacred altar where we do sacrifices every year to keep up those annual cycles of fertility from the fields. And I started to realize that the cycles of fertility were just like the recursive cycles in the, the geometric algorithm that builds this. And the recursion in some of these villages continues down to very tiny scales. So here's a, a Nankani village in Mali. And you can see you go inside the family enclosure, you go inside, and here's pots in the, the fireplace stacked recursively. Here's uh, calabashes that, that uh, uh, Issa was just showing us, and they're stacked recursively. Now, the tiniest calabash in here keeps the woman's soul. 